Good morning, church. I would like to welcome everyone to church today. I hope we are all having um, an enjoyable weekend and we are all getting the rest that we need um, in this season. Uh, by God's grace, this season would be over soon, uh, but let's make uh, the best use of what this season um, is bringing. And if there's any positive we can take out of this season, um, it's time to ourselves. Uh, so today's teaching um, is a continuation of our series of teaching on our focus for this month, which is all around rest. And so far we have considered that there's a special rest that God has prepared for his people and that rest is found in Christ. Last week, we painted um, a picture of what all-round rest looks like by considering the life of King Solomon. And we established that all-round rest involves uh, increasing in wisdom, rest spiritually, rest physically, and rest relationally. So rest in those four dimensions. So building on last week's message, uh, today's message is titled Wisdom for All-Round Rest. Uh, shall we just bow our heads in prayer as we go into the message? Father, we thank you for um, you are the only wise God. And as we consider wisdom from your word today, Lord, we pray that you grant us insight, Lord, grant us revelation from your word and give us the grace to be doers and not just hearers of that that we hear. Lord, I pray that our hearts are prepared today, uh, like the fertile soil, cause your word to just find a good space in the soil of our hearts today and cause it to bring forth a hundredfold of harvest to the glory of your name in Jesus name. Let us not live the same way we came Lord but let us be transformed by the renewing of our mind in Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please turn with me your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4 as we read verses 6 to 8. Proverbs chapter 4 and we read verses 6 to 8. It says, do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Proverbs 4, 6 to 8. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. Proverbs 2, verse 6, New Living Translation. Proverbs 2, verse 6, from the NLT. For the, land, for the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. There are three concepts that are often described together in the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs, and they are wisdom, understanding and knowledge. Now these three concepts are related, but they are not one and the same thing. Knowledge um, is acquisition of information, gathering information through experience, through reasoning, through acquaintance. So we gather information, we gain knowledge by experience, reasoning or acquaintance. So to be knowledgeable means to have information about something or someone. If I say I'm knowledgeable about a particular thing, I have information about that thing. Knowledge is put in a different way, having the facts to hand. That's what knowledge is. Understanding, on the other hand, is the ability to get meaning from those facts. So with knowledge, you gather the facts. They may not necessarily make sense to you. For you to make sense out of that information, that's understanding, the ability to get meaning from facts. When a person has understanding, they not only know the facts, they know the meaning of those facts. Now, wisdom is the next level. Wisdom is knowing what to do, giving the understanding of, of the facts, of the circumstances. So you have that information, you know the meaning of it. Wisdom is now knowing what to do with it. It's the application of knowledge to real life situations. 
So if I were to summarize those three, knowledge is the what. What is it about? Understanding is the why. You understand, you, you get the meaning, the, you have an insight into it, and wisdom is the how. So if I use a real uh, life experience that many of us encounter um, on a daily basis, Knowledge is seeing that the light has turned red when you're driving. Understanding is insights that that red light means you should stop. And wisdom is stepping on the brakes so that your car comes to a halt. That's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So from that illustration, you can see that a person can have knowledge without understanding or understanding without wisdom. But it's impossible to have wisdom without knowledge and understanding. And this is why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing, because it's the sum of it all. The whole idea of knowledge is so that we can understand it and be able to apply it to a given situation or circumstance. And that's what wisdom is. And that's why it's the principal thing. Principal means foundational. It's the foundational thing. It's the one thing you cannot do without. It's the supreme thing, one that you must esteem above all others. Because more often than not in life, problems arise because wisdom is lacking in a particular area. Not always, but more often than not, problems arise because wisdom is lacking in a particular area. Many people think that they have money problems. In reality, what they have is wisdom problem. Because we've known from experiences and history that people can be the brokers of broke. And yet when they gain wisdom, they can achieve phenomenal wealth. We know from experience that people can be in debt and when they seek the needed help and get the right wisdom, they can settle all their debt and be on their pathway to wealth. People don't often have money problems. What they have is wisdom problems. Many people think they have a relationship problem. In reality, what they have again is wisdom problem. It's not a relationship problem. I watched a movie a while ago, I think it's fireproof. And in one of the conversations between two chaps, one of them was talking about counseling and he was telling his friend who was having marital problems to try. It. And the friend said, oh, I don't believe in counseling. Well, what did you learn from it? And he said, I learned that my marriage was not broken. My marriage was not the problem. What I didn't know was how to run it, how to run the marriage. So that's sometimes, and in, in many instances, and, and as somebody who has been involved in counseling couples a couple of times, I know that often the issue is not the person's concern. It is because wisdom is lacking. It's a wisdom problem. Other people think that they have a problem child. Again, the problem is not the child, but the absence of wisdom to deal with the child's behavior. Some people think that they have a problem passing an examination or getting a job. The reality of the matter is that what they often have is a wisdom problem. They don't have the wisdom for approaching the exam. Haven't done countless exams in my life. I know that every exam has a technique for approaching it. And more often than not, knowledge is just halfway there. The technique for approaching it is probably what will get you all the way there. Some people go for job interviews and they keep getting rejected. And they feel the problem is that people don't like their face. In reality, the problem they have is a wisdom problem. They don't know how to approach job interviews because even with interviews, there are techniques. The same answer, you can give it in a different way and not get the job, but give it in the way that you should give it, then you get the job. I remember my first interview in the UK this was my first interview for a medical job. And I finished that interview, I thought I had done very well. And I was speaking to a friend um, who 
was one of those instrumental in putting me through um, in my early days in the UK, because he had been in the UK about two or three years before me. And I was telling him, he was asking me, so what questions were you asked? And was, I was giving him the answer confidently in the belief that I had done very well. And he was just listening. And when he finished, he started to give me feedback. And one of the feedback was that, well, I hope you get the job. <laughs> when he said that, obviously, he, didn't, he wasn't very confident I was going to get the job. And in reality, I ended up not getting the job. But one of the things he told me, like a very good example, uh, they asked me what was my career goal. And I was talking about, yeah, I want to climb the ladder and after some years, go back to Nigeria and set up my own center and all of that. And he was telling me, and he said, here, uh, the NHS is paid for by public fund. People want to know that they are using their money to train doctors who are going to stay here to look after them. He said, even if you have the vision of going back to Nigeria, never ever in your life mention that again in an interview. And that was wisdom. So I thought I did well. I didn't get the job because I didn't have the wisdom for it. So in many areas, we lack the wisdom. That's the reason why we struggle. The solution to many of the problems we face in life is wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. That's the solution more often than not. Albert Einstein famously said, no problem can be, can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. What did Albert Einstein mean? What he's saying is that the, prob that the problem developed is a pointer to the fact that there's something you're not doing correctly at your current level of awareness. There's a level of awareness that you're operating at that has brought about that problem. If you must resolve that problem, you need an increased awareness. You need the knowledge that you don't have right now to apply to solve that problem. So you need wisdom that is specific to solving that problem. The wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon puts it in another way. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. This is what he said. He said, if the ax is dull, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. If the ax is dull and you don't sharpen the edge, you're gonna use more strength. Sharpening the ax is the same as wisdom, to uh, applying wisdom to our everyday life events. Imagine what it must look like to cut down a tree with an ax. Nowadays, in this part of the world, they don't, they don't use axes again, but, but just think back, remember what an ax was like. And imagine using that to cut down a tree and you haven't sharpened it. Think of how many hours that would take you. Think of how much strength that you need to apply. That's how it is when we operate in life in any area without wisdom in that area. The presence of struggle is often an indication of the absence of wisdom. Now, the understanding of this truth is liberating and your life will change for the better once you recognize it. Your approach to situation will change once you understand this truth. You will stop blaming other people and circumstances for when things are not working. Rather, you will recognize that there is a wisdom that you're lacking in that area that you need to get in order to be able to move past that situation. Wisdom is what will guarantee us the enjoyment of all round rest. Now that we've considered the importance of wisdom, I want us to consider how we get this wisdom because it's no good knowing what wisdom can do for us and not knowing how to get it. So we're gonna look in God's word and see how can we get wisdom? The number one way we get wisdom is to recognize that wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. Earlier on, we read Proverbs 2, 6, where he says, from the Lord, for the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So wisdom is something that absolutely comes from God. James chapter 1, verse 5, also buttresses this a uh, point that wisdom comes from God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God 
who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God gives wisdom liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So true wisdom, or what the Bible calls godly wisdom, or the wisdom from above, comes from God and God alone. But the Bible is careful to make a distinction between this kind of wisdom that comes from God and another type of wisdom that the Bible calls earthly or worldly wisdom. Let's read James chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, where it makes a distinction between these two kinds of wisdom. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So James is making a distinction of two kinds of wisdom here. There's an, it, both types of wisdom are known by the kind of fruits that they bear. There's a kind of wisdom that James says is centered around bitter envy, that is self-seeking. That kind of wisdom, James says, is earthly, it's sensual, and above all, it's demonic. But the wisdom that comes from God is pure. All of us know what purity is about. When something is pure, you, you know it. You, you cannot mistake it for anything else. It brings peace. It's peaceable. It's gentle. That wisdom is willing to yield. It's not always about having its own way. That wisdom is full of mercy. Grants mercy to other people. Be merciful unto others so that you can obtain mercy. It bears good fruits. That wisdom doesn't show partiality. That wisdom is not disguised with hypocrisy. Let's use some real life examples for this. For example, a person who has many problems may come up with a solution to solving that problem. They have money problem and they have access to some information. They could choose to divert funds that is in their custody and meant for something else to meet their own needs. They could embezzle the funds altogether. That kind of wisdom will bring a solution to them. Their money problem may be solved temporarily, maybe permanently, but they have solved it using the wisdom of the world. The Bible calls that kind of wisdom self-seeking. And you can see why it calls it self-seeking. Because in a bid to meet your own need, you have diverted the funds or embezzled the funds met, meant to meet the needs of other people. It doesn't matter what suffering comes to the people that are the, uh, are, are the, uh, the end users that the money was meant for, as far as your own need is meant. So you can see that, that by the Bible, why the Bible calls that kind of wisdom self-seeking. But above all, it's not only self-seeking, that kind of wisdom is demonic because it's, it's not come from your own mind, it's come from the devil. It's come from Satan's kingdom. It will have repercussions because at the end of the day, it will end in sorrow. The Bible says it's the Lord's blessings that makes rich and does not add sorrow. So there are other kinds of blessings. They can make rich, but they will add sorrow. That's the difference between godly wisdom and the sensual wisdom or earthly wisdom that the Bible is talking about. And it's especially important to be mindful, for believers to be mindful of this. In my short days of existence, I have seen believers do the most unbelievable things in the name of what they call wisdom. It is earthly wisdom, it's demonic, it's sensual, it's not pure, it's not from God. We cannot afford to be like the world in how we solve problematic situations. Now, because this is on air, I cannot give examples, but I hope you understand some of the things because I, in, in, especially here in the UK, some of you too would have seen some or encountered people 
will use the sensual and earthly wisdom that is not pure. Straight away, you know, just looking at it, you know, this cannot be right. But people say, we will do it and they will beg God for forgiveness. That wisdom is demonic, is going to have repercussions. God may forgive you, but you will reap what you sow. We cannot build our lives on one lie after the other and say it does not matter. It does matter. But all we need to do, the Bible says, is to ask God for wisdom. God does not withhold it. He's not stingy with it. God's, the Bible says God gives that kind of wisdom liberally. But it starts from the foundation of the fear of God to make a decision that, you know what, whatever the case, I will not sin against my God. I will not sin against my conscience. You know, the Joseph could have seen a solution in going to bed with Potiphar's wife. He was already head of the house. No doubt, had he obliged her, he would enjoy lots of favors, uh, even without Potiphar knowing. But Joseph was not about what was in it for him. He said, how can I do this thing this wicked thing and sin against my God. That's the important thing. That's the critical thing. And God gave him the kind of wisdom that ultimately got him to where he needed to go through. Yeah, temporarily he had to go to jail, but at the end of the day, he got to his destiny. God's wisdom will always land us in a peaceable place in the long run. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So a godly type of wisdom is rooted in the fear of God. What does it mean to fear God? It means quite a number of things, but firstly, it means a recognition that he is God and you are not. He is God and you're not. And that statement is loaded with so many things. When you recognize that he is God and you're not, you recognize that his wisdom as far from yours, as far as the heaven is from the earth. So when he says this is the way to do it, you realize that he knows what he's saying and you learn to lean on his wisdom. You learn to trust his words, what he said and how he said it should be done. We need to ask God for this wisdom, but it starts in the fear of God. The second thing or the second way we get wisdom is that wisdom increases from meditating on God's word. Wisdom increases from meditating on God's word. In the first message of this series, when I listed three ways that we can enjoy all round rest, I stated that the third way is to do what God says. How do you know what God has said? Is by meditating on his word. That's how you get to know what God has said. There's a reason the Bible is called the book of wisdom because it contains the express intentions of God's heart. That's why it's called the book of wisdom. It's a revelation of God's wisdom. There's no area of life, I repeat, there's no area of life that is not covered in the Bible. We struggle only because we don't know them. You know, this time of the pandemic, I discovered some more and because part of my devotional in, in, during the first lockdown was Leviticus. I found that even the things that we base our sciences, our science on today, self-isolation, social distancing, hand washing, covering of face, go to Leviticus. You will see all these public health principles in place as a way that God told the children of Israel to curb pandemic from spreading in their midst in those days. All these health precautions were there. If you want to know about project management, go and read the book of Nehemiah and see how he managed the project of rebuilding the world. Every single area of human endeavor, the wisdom for it is found in God's word. We only don't know them because we don't take time to meditate on God's word. Proverbs chapter one, verse five says a wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. A wise man will hear and increase learning. Remember in the days that this was written, the way people primarily gained knowledge was through hearing because many of the things were spoken, the wisdom were in the spoken words. It was called the oral traditions um, of the prophets. So as they spoke, 
people listened. So if this was written in today's time, it would read something like a wise man will read and increase learning since that's the primary way that we gain knowledge now. Most things are written in the books and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Matthew chapter seven, verse 24. It says, therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I would liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Who is the wise man? The one who hears the sayings of Jesus, the words of Jesus, and does them. Hearing alone is not enough. In fact, in subsequent verses, the foolish person, Jesus likened to the person who heard and did not do. So the wisdom is in knowing what God says from meditation and applying it to our lives. That's how we get the results. That's how we increase in wisdom. Number three way in which we gain wisdom is that we increase in wisdom by keeping wise company. We increase in wisdom by keeping wise company. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, he who walks with wise men will be what? Will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companions of fools will be destroyed. Do not be deceived, people of God. Wisdom is contagious in the same way that foolishness is. If you keep company with the wise, you will become wise. In the same vein, if you keep company with fools, you will become foolish. So the company you keep is very important. And when you think relationships, think of relationship in three dimensions. The first dimension is relationship with the people above you. These are parents, mentors, coaches, leaders, they are the people who by virtue of age and experience know more than you do. Learn all you can from them. They should inspire you. Every one of us must have people that we look up to, that can inspire us, that we can learn wisdom from. People that we can take questions to by the leading of the Holy Spirit and expect to get answers. This includes mentors, that you may not be able to relate with physically most of the times. Get their products, get their books, get their teachings, watch their teachings, listen to them as you drive. You gain wisdom from that. Pastor Yonggi Cho, in one of his books, said something, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, when you read a person's book, you may read in 10 chapters what took the person 10 years to learn. So you have saved yourself 10 years of another person's experience. All the mistakes he made in that period, you have saved yourself those by just reading those 10 chapters that he's written. You can gain wisdom even from people following them in the ways they have expressed the wisdom of God in their life. The second dimension of relationship is with your peers. People at the same level as yourself. Even these people must be wise people. They must be people who challenge you to be better in a healthy way. They are friends that I've had for three decades or more. And our friendship is still as strong as ever. Every time we speak, we, don't, we, don't, we may not speak that often by reason of distance, but whenever we speak, we spend quality time on the calls and I am challenged speaking to them in the same way that they are challenged speaking to me. Keep that kind of company. You need people who will challenge you. There must be people that challenge you to be better in a healthy way. You know, challenge you to want to do better. You want to hear of their success and be challenged to do more. Not the kind of friendship that generates envy, but it's, it's, it's a competitive in a very positive way inspires you and motivates you in a very positive way. Also, you need a relationship with those below you. And below, I'm just talking about in terms of as they look up to you in certain area, not that you look down on them. So I, I, I don't mean below in that sense. I'm talking about protégés, mentees, people who look up to you for inspiration. 
that relationship ensures that one, you're giving back also as you're getting from those above you, you're giving back. But it also ensures that you stay motivated to become better. You know, to always want to increase your capacity so that you can have more to give. We all need those three levels of relationships in our lives. And the final way for today's message in which we get wisdom is that wisdom comes from reflection. Wisdom comes from reflection. You have heard it said before that experience is the best teacher. But like Jesus, I say to you that experience is not the best teacher. Rather, it is the experience you learn from that becomes a good teacher to you. Not everyone learns from experience because not everyone reflects on their experience. And if they don't reflect on it, they cannot learn. Although the experience may have been designed to teach them an awful lot, they don't learn it because they don't reflect on those experiences. So they make the same mistakes again and again because they have not reflected on their experience. Wisdom, however, comes from our ability to reflect on our experiences. Those experiences are nothing more than experiences if you don't reflect on them. It's by reflecting on them that you learn the lessons from them to be able to do things differently the next time. Proverbs chapter 22, verse three. Proverbs 22, verse three says, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Why does the prudent man foresee the evil and avoid it? Because he's learned from it. He may have fallen into the same trap before, but because he's reflected and knew exactly why he experienced that difficulty, he learned from it. So now he's able to see it from afar the next time and avoid it. But the foolish person doesn't learn, goes into it, doesn't reflect and repeats the same mistake next time. And this is why we cannot simply afford to jump from one task to another mindlessly. We must periodically take time to reflect on the things that we do and how we do them to ensure that we are learning from them. It was Doug King that said, learn to pause or nothing worthwhile will catch up to you. Learn to pause or nothing worthwhile will catch up to you. Equally, you must be deliberate about asking for feedback and graciously receive feedback when it is offered to you. You see, we all have what is called blind spots, areas of our lives that we cannot see, but others can see them. The only way we get to know about these areas is through feedback. And this is one advantage of living in a country such as ours. Very quickly, I realized that the system is heavily based on feedback. In your work, you will need a multi-source feedback. You will have an appraisal regularly where your line manager gives you feedback, but not only from your line manager, from your other colleagues that you work with. And the whole purpose is to help you see those blind spots so that you can improve on it. And it is wisdom to ask for those sort of feedback. The system here encourages feedback. And anyone of any age can give you good feedback. And it's very important to say this. I know some Africans, especially men, are not very open to receiving feedback from people younger than them. It's a feeling of, what do you know? I've been here longer than you. That is a very dangerous spirit to have. It's not a good thing. Anyone of any age should be able to give you feedback. Receive the feedback with gratitude. Reflect on it. Take what is useful out of it. It will make you wiser. Not everything that is given to you as feedback might be useful, but at the very least, you should consider it. You should receive it with gratitude and go reflect on it and take away that that you need to work on. That's how you get wiser. In conclusion, people of God, wisdom 
is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Let us pray. The Lord gives wisdom. And from him comes understanding and knowledge. I want us to pray today for wisdom. That the Lord will increase us in wisdom. I want us to pray specifically for any area of struggle that we have been going through or are going through right now. I want you to pray specifically for wisdom in that area, be it your relationships, be it your relationship at home, your relationship with your children, your relationship at work, be it your finances, be it your health. Pray that the Lord will give you the wisdom that you need for that area. I said that struggle is often the evidence that wisdom is lacking. I want us to ask the Lord for wisdom. He gives liberally. He does not withhold. Let us ask him today, knowing that our request is rooted in the fear of God. Let's ask for that wisdom that is pure, that wisdom that gives mercy, that wisdom that does not withhold in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We ask for wisdom liberally. We thank you that we can come to you and ask for wisdom because you give it liberally. Lord, give us wisdom today in the name of Jesus. In every area of struggle, cause your light to shine. Cause your wisdom to fill our lives in this area. I want you to pray prayerfully. Think about the company that you keep. Can you say you're in the company of the wise? Do you have mentors that you look up to that can instruct you and guide you? Do you have peers that challenge you? Do you have proteges that motivate you? I want you to pray today that the Lord would help you in your relationships as you build and strengthen those areas in the name of Jesus. The Lord will lead you to the right people for you, the company of the wise people that you should keep. I want you to pray that Fresh revelation will be your portion as you meditate on God's word. I said God's word covers every area of our lives, every single area. We only may not have found it. I want you to pray that as you make a commitment to meditate on God's word, that fresh revelation be yours in the name of Jesus, that you will find the wisdom that you need at the times that you need them in the name of Jesus. And finally, I want you to pray for the wisdom to pause and reflect, to not just carry on doing things mindlessly, but to be able to reflect on the things that you do, to see if this is the best way to do them, to learn any lessons as you do those things. I want you to pray that the Lord will give you that grace to be able to pause and to reflect. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to make a call this morning and it's the, the most important call of this morning. The Lord gives wisdom. That wisdom is found in Christ. The Bible calls him the wisdom of God. If you have not at any point in time made a definite decision to hand over your life to Christ so that you can enjoy this all round rest so that he can be the Lord and master of your life. I want to throw an open invitation to you this morning wherever you are, to just come with a decision in your mind that you want Christ to be the leader and ruler of your life. If you're ready to make that decision this morning, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. Father, I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I confess that I am in need of a savior and I believe and accept that Jesus is the savior for me. I ask you to come live in me, be the master and ruler of my life. From this moment, I denounce Satan and his works, and I declare that I am saved and I am a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you said that prayer, I rejoice with you 
and all every one of us here rejoices with you today because on account of the faith in your heart and the confession of your words you are now a child of God your name is written in the Lamb's book of life you are saved and delivered from your sins I ask you to get in touch with us um, using the church's email and phone details, info at cianorthampton.org, so that we know that you've made this decision and we can encourage you in how to grow in this journey that you have just started. Father, I just want to thank you for your word today. Thank you for just reminding us of the central place of wisdom in our lives. Lord, I pray that you grant us the grace to be doers of these same words that we have heard today. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen.